today's message. Now we have today's message given to us by Beth Poole. But first I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. This is Beth's mission statement. Our mission is to change the world by helping people discover their own power through identification and activation of their core values. We are grateful that our own personal studies and life experiences has informed this sacred work. And her business is called Greater Vision Life Coaching. Beth Hadwith Gold is a life coach, professional trainer, and dynamic public speaker. As owner of Greater Vision Life Coaching, LLC, her personal growth workshops and individual coaching sessions are known for life-changing results. Beth has over 20 years of corporate supervisory and management experience. She earned a BA with honors from the University of Pittsburgh and attended Unity Worldwide Spiritual Institute for two years of in-depth exploration and personal growth. Let's welcome Beth. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to apologize for my allergies. Um, <clears throat> Turns out I forgot to take my allergy medicine this morning. I'm allergic to my beautiful big dog. <laughs> so the talk I wrote is called Oak Tree, um, which is why the song at the very beginning, which by the way is, is by Lua Maria and Adrian Friedman. Um, so I wrote the talk and then I got up this morning to you know refresh myself and I looked at it and I said, oh my gosh, this is not the talk I wanted to write. <laughs> so I did some rewriting and listening a lot to the Oak Tree song to really grok what it had to say. And uh, so I don't know what's gonna come out today. I have notes and I'll, we'll see if I follow. <laughs> so I wanted to start by asking, where do you feel your sense of connection, of freedom, um, you know, and where physically is it? here? Is it in uh, classes you take? Is it in nature? Or hobbies where you get lost doing what your soul loves to do? It can be any of those places or any other places. My dear friend Mary finds it at loud screaming rock concerts. <laughs> so whatever it is <clears throat> in Unity where I'm more most of my studies are from, and in CSL, which I've studied a bit, um, our perception is that this spirit of creation, whatever we call it, God, the silent one, uh, di the divine, whatever we call it in any faith, is everywhere present, meaning it's in us and it's all around us. It's in the very loud motorcycle racing by during our meditation before the service. It's in every expression of life, even those we object to. <laughs> so it's this great divine mystery that just when I'm in a good space, delights and fascinates my heart, my soul, my mind. So <clears throat> one of the uh, places that I find my connection most strongly is in nature and particularly in trees. I worship trees. I'm not able to tell you which tree is which other than that's an evergreen and that's deciduous. <laughs> but I worship trees. They bring us so much. They bring us the very air we breathe. And as it talked about in the oak tree song, they provide years, decades, centuries of stillness, of calm, witness. I want to be like trees. So this talk is dedicated to my dear friends Ron and Marianne Chapman, and I will try not to cry. Ron made his transition on July 26th. I wanted to comfort his wife, Marianne, who's one of my oldest and dearest friends. We met in college in Pennsylvania. Before long, I was hanging out at their house all the time. Eventually, I moved in for a while <laughs> and babysat their three boys as they were growing up. Well, the smallest boy was Christopher. He was about four years old. 
And so I, for some reason, have this love of children's songs. The more bizarre, the better. And camp songs from Girl Scouts. And here was an audience who thought they were great. So I sang to Christopher. And he grew up to be a musician anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so he has been a self-supporting musician all his adult life. He's never done anything else. Wow. Yeah. So um, his family, the men especially in his family, who are hard-working individuals, say that Christopher's never worked a day in his life. He's always playing. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, um, Christopher, it turned out, the, the week following the death of his dad was uh, playing in a three-day concert event in Brownsville, Oregon way south um and i had already decided not to go and then marianne decided she was there i could not pass up that opportunity so i drove to brownsville all the way thinking how can i support this woman that ha is so much a part of me that i love so deeply how can i help how can i soothe her pain <clears throat> you know, and underneath that is, how can I fix it, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a helper. I'm a helper by nature. I work in mental health. I work in, a, in addiction recovery, which turned out many times to be the same thing. But <clears throat> at any rate, when I'm working with people, I totally get in my mind that being still, listening, and simply witnessing is a wonderful healing opening process for, for them and often for me because I learned to recognize things in me. Well, when it comes to people I love so dearly, I don't get that. It hasn't traveled too much to my heart. I tell myself that I'm feeling their pain, right? Because I'm an empath. So I'm feeling Marianne's pain. I'm feeling Christopher's pain. And here he is performing publicly, having just lost the most important man in his life. <clears throat> now, Ron Chatham was, and he is, one of the men I have most admired in my life. And there aren't that many, really, when it comes down to it. He's, it's not that he was perfect, but he was someone I admired his strength, his tenacity, his commitments to his family above all else, um, and many other things. Anyway, so on the way to Brownsville, without knowing it, I stuffed my own deep grief. I think at some level I was afraid of it. I was unable to perceive it. I just stuffed it um, in my glorious effort to be there for them and help them, I had to put my feelings aside. <sighs> hmm. Well, Brownsville, Brownsville, the, the experience was delightful, heart-opening, uh, devastating, and great fun. It was, it was everything all at once. And uh, so we had a, a decent time, I should say. I hadn't seen Marianne in six years, so it was um, long overdue. You know, I actually got to hug her, which touched me. So, um, in the in the meantime, some decades ago, so in college, we didn't. Neither of us had any sort of sense of excuse, of uh, religion or spirituality. Not that we knew. And we'd both been raised Catholic. Well, in the past decade or two, Marianne had rediscovered and recommitted to Catholicism. While I had been on a very different path with CSL thoughts, with unity, with new thought, if you will, um, which entailed a whole lot of self-exploration and as I'm discovering forever, <laughs> I will be doing self-exploration. <laughs> uh, so how can I help? It wouldn't help to spout my beliefs, to spout principles of CSL, of unity. That was not going to be helpful to her, and I knew it. 
so where was I? I mean, I was, I was like, how do I help? I have no idea. And uh, I just, I coached myself on the way down to just listen, to allow Mary and Chris to be how they were, to have their, their time, their feeling, their time of grief. At least that was my intention. When I had a quiet time with Marianne, I think I was nervous. I think I was afraid of my own deep grief. I chattered almost incessantly, which is what I do when I'm nervous. I'm a talker. Um, so finally, I don't know, day two or three, I asked her, so how can I best support you? And she said, just be quiet. <laughs> Let me be quiet. Just be quiet. So there was my challenge. And uh, so I was, I, I, I got quieter, I think. Marianne can probably answer that question. <laughs> At any rate, um, so I'm driving home and I hear the oak tree song. And I take a deep breath and realize that the growth is in me. I was stuck in what I felt. And had I really allowed myself those feelings I would have allowed a greater heart connection with Marianne and Chris. Denying my grief and my feelings only created a barrier between us at some level. I mean, we were happy to connect and it kind of felt superficial. So I realized uh, as I listened more and more to the song, I think I put it on repeat, um, that the growth needed to happen in me that I needed to address what were my past griefs? Because I believe quite firmly that any loss we have, any significant loss, brings up all the grief we previously experienced or not allowed ourselves to experience. So we become reactive from that place. And I wept. Um, I'm pretty good at driving while I weep because <laughs> I was in therapy for years. <laughs> All right, so I realized that had I been their calm witness of 300 years or however long they needed it, that would have been more effective. And, you know, since then, um, I've realized that my desire to help is a desire to fix and a desire to not feel my own feelings. And wow, this is, this is wow to me, despite all my years of work and study. <sighs> what else did I write? <laughs> oh, one thing that in my work I have tried to communicate to the folks I work with is that wherever we are in life is okay, really. So maybe people feel that they're at the bottom of the bottom where I have been several times. And that's okay, because we're all exactly where we need to be to move on the rest of our path, right? So for Ron and Chris and the rest of their very large family, it's okay for them to grieve and express that in any way they need to. No judgment. Um, you know, if, if they need to thrash around and throw things, express some anger, simply weep. I can be their oak tree now. <laughs> I can be there for them. So what's up with the oak tree? I, I, I had to read about it online. What's the spiritual meaning? And it turns out it goes way, way back. So the first recorded records of the spiritual meaning of the oak tree are from the Celtic uh, crowd. <laughs> so for them, the oak tree represented hospitality, Right? The acceptance of whoever comes in. Safety that we provide for whoever comes in. Truth. Truth, need I say more? And bravery. So bravery in ourselves to feel what we feel. These are my interpretations of that. Other traditions note that the oak tree represents power, survival, and ancient wisdom, which all kind of fit with this new paradigm from the song. In short, the oak tree invites us to become the heroes in our own lives. 
where we are weighed down by things that challenge us, by our own negative feelings, by our own greed. Now we can reinterpret that story to be much more powerful. If the challenge is for me to rewrite my story as my own hero, then I can see that, sure, I was like, I've, I've been hospitalized for psychotic episodes and whatnot four times, and yet now I am my own hero. I've found recovery. I've studied. I've gone deep, which is why whenever I encounter judgments about myself, like I'm stuffing my emotions, I have to remind myself that I'm going to be going deep the rest of my life. That's kind of what it's all about. Yeah. So, I need to acknowledge my truth. The upside and the downside of the oak is its firmness, right? Uh, when a storm comes, the oak stands solid, where other trees will bend in the wind. So the oak loses more branches during a storm than the trees that sway and go with the flow, right? So that's kind of the downside and the upside. The oak is very strong, very solid and could benefit from bending the world in a metaphysical sense. So I sat under my own oak tree. I listened for the message of the silent one. And I found that it was all okay. It was all it was okay that I was stuck in my feelings. That's exactly where I needed to be. It was okay that I showed up to Marianne and Chris stuffing my feelings, because that, that was exactly what needed to happen. Everything that happens in life, including the loud motorcycle, which I very much affected, it is part of the divine. It's part of the mystery. So after I got home, I was getting ready for a class I was teaching, and I found a Pema Chodron exercise. Do you all know who Pema Chodron is? So she's a Buddhist monk the first female Buddhist monk in the U.S. And she's phenomenal. She's definitely on YouTube and many books and any place you want to find her podcast. So I watched an interview, Oprah interviewing Pema Chodron. You all know who Oprah is, I'm thinking. Anyway, <clears throat> so they stumbled across the idea of an exercise that Pema had written about in one of her books. And it's called Like Me, they. <clears throat> so here are some examples. I'm waiting in line at the gas station and it's a really long line. And, I, and I'm irritated. Or I'm stuck in traffic. And I, I go to this exercise. Like me, they. They want to get somewhere on time. Right? They want to get home and rest after a long day. It's payday. They want to get their tank filled up. Whatever it might be, it causes us, when we finish that sentence, to feel more uh, the oneness with all it is. When the motorcycle goes by, I need to recognize, like me, they love to go fast, which I do. <laughs> they love to feel the wind in their hair, which I do. Um, you know, where can I connect? So. I did like me day with Marianne and Ron, Marianne and Ron and Chris and myself. Like me, they probably want to be seen and heard for who they are right now, right? That, like me, I want to be seen by them and heard right now, no matter how I feel, no matter what I'm doing. So what I needed to do or what I need to do in future opportunities is to honor the process, right? Honor the process of getting from where I am to where I want to be, or the process of uh, witnessing someone else getting from where they are to where they want to be. I need to turn it all over to my higher power and follow that river to my own oak tree. So I'm glad to say that Marianne and Chris, well, deeply mourning, deeply in grief, are doing fine. We're, we're still in uh, frequent contact 
and the love is there as it always be.